Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we are concluding our multiple week study of the Upaya Kashalya Sutra, the Sutra on Expedient Means. So today's going to be kind of a, a, a summary of the whole sutra. Uh, just to let you know, I was just looking, uh, looking back in time, and it was on January 8th of this year that we started this series on Upaya. Um, I think the video premiered January 11th. Um, so that was our first class in which I introduced this sutra and introduced the topic of Upaya. And then this will be the 23rd session of that. So 23, not too bad for <clears throat> studying a sutra. Um, so yeah, so let's dive in. Um, again, because it took so long, because it took 23 sessions, I know that we can sort of lose focus of the sutra as a whole like wait how did we get here why are we talking about these things so again today we're going to kind of do a grand summary um so the first thing because you may not have been there the first night or you you know might have missed it or something so the sutra that we've been reading for the last few months comes to us from a collection of sutras called the Maha, uh, Maha Ratnakuta Sutra Collection. The Maha Ratnakuta, which means the pile or the heap of jewels, it is kind of considered one big mega sutra, but it really is an anthology. It's, a, it's rather a, a collection of sutras. And I probably mentioned this, the opening night or at some point, it seems that, you know, a collection of sutras like this, it seems that there we have historical records of there being a, Maha, a group of Mahayana Buddhists, a pretty large group of Mahayana Buddhists living in sort of southern eastern India, who this Maha Ratnakuta Sutra collection was like their library. It was their collection of sutras. And so what I want to remind you of or mention, if you didn't catch it the first time, this particular collection of sutras, it sort of represents a, a world of Buddhism, kind of all by itself. And there are many worlds of Buddhism. And I particularly am, I'm very particularly interested in this world of Buddhism that is represented by the Ratnakuta collection, because there's a lot of very interesting sutras in there. I consider them, a lot of them to be very progressive in that sense. They're very, um, they're just sort of a, the type of Buddhism that I'm particularly really interested in, which is why I wanted to spend so much time talking about it. In this collection, oh, and I, I keep pointing to this book, of course, which is our Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, which many of you have. Just want you to know, of course, that this is not a complete translation of the Maharatnakuta collection. The whole collection is 49 sutras, but many of those, many of those 49 sutras are very long like there's one of them i believe it is called the bodhisattva treasury sutra or something to that effect and it's many 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 volumes and that's just one sutra and that is not translated in here i think they only translate some you know 20 forget exactly how many sutras they translate in here 22 of the 49. So we are still waiting for how to have English translations of the rest of the sutras. 
Um, the other thing too, sadly, that I've mentioned many times, these sutras in this book, they are not in the order in which they are originally appear in the collection. And this book gives them all yet new numbers, <laughs> like totally different numbers. So I know that that can be a little for confusing for people, but just want you to know that. Um, cool. Um, as usual, we need to talk about the title, even though we are kind of recapping. But this is the Upaya Kushalya Sutra, the sutra on means, upaya, but not just any means, kushalya upaya, skillful means. And I kind of just want to remind everybody that actually the word upaya, it just means uh, a means of doing something, a way of doing something. It could be skillful. It could not be skillful. And so you talk about upaya kashalya, skillful upaya. But within the world of Buddhism, eventually we just come to associate the word upaya with skillful means or expedient means. <clears throat> this title, this sorry, this sutra is also sometimes called the Nyanotada Sutra. And that's because the primary bodhisattva that's in this sutra that asks the Buddha all the questions is named Nyanotada. Uh, I believe in this translation, they translate his name as superior wisdom. So that's Nyanotada. And this happens a lot. You might have noticed this if you've been coming to Dharma doors for a while, that a lot of these sutras the, a lot of these Mahayana sutras, they'll have like two names, maybe even three different names. And it's because, <clears throat> well, it's probably for a lot of reasons, but it's important to remember that these were, were not are not books, right? These are not published material that you would find in a Barnes and Noble. <laughs> these are like sacred literature in that way that have circulated throughout the world, you know, as we know, to Tibet, to China, to Japan. And so you get different titles for these sutras that pop up, depending on what the emphasis is. Is the emphasis on the message of the sutra? Or, as is often the case, the title of the sutra is based on the characters, like, say, for example, the famous Vimalakirti Sutra. It's because it's about the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti, and so on. So, okay, but let's get to the topic that Nyanotara, the Bodhisattva Nyanotara, the sutra starts off right away. The Bodhisattva Nyanotara goes to the Buddha and asks, um, how does a Bodhisattva practice upaya? That's the question. And so I am going to kind of go through the sutra, just the, you know, the major movements of the sutra, but I do want to spend a little bit of time at the opening, like kind of right now. And I want to do a kind of a really big zoom out and have just a, a, a short conversation about Upaya as it has been presented in the sutra. But there's sort of like, I would say two major themes that this sutra is dealing with. I mean, two major themes regarding upaya. So that's what it's about. One theme, and I'm going to start just with this idea. So the one theme is sort of, well, it has to do with Nyanotara's question. What is upaya? How does a bodhisattva practice upaya? And the Buddha, at the very beginning of the sutra, he gives like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like eight, nine, or ten, depends on how you count these. But the Buddha gives about eight, nine, or ten examples to the Bodhisattva of what it means to practice upaya. 
And I really think, you know, that if you wanted to study this sutra, you should you would you would do well to pay attention to these opening uh, verses or these opening sections of the Buddha's answer to Nyanotara. So the very first answer actually contains in it a tremendous amount of information. And what I mean is, is this is the Buddha's first answer. And this will just kind of give us a flavor again for the sutra. So the Buddha says to the Bodhisattva, a Bodhisattva who practices upaya can use even a handful of food as alms for all sentient beings. Why? When a bodhisattva who practices upaya gives a handful of food to any single sentient being, even an animal, they do so with an aspiration for all knowing wisdom and vows to share the merit of this giving with all sentient beings by dedicating or transferring it to the universal attainment of supreme enlightenment. Because of these two, the Bodhisattva seeking all-knowing wisdom and this skillful vow, the Bodhisattva attracts sentient beings into their following. This is the upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva. So I want to talk about those two aspects of this. So there were two things in this, the, what is called the pursuit in a way, the pursuit of all knowing wisdom or all knowing enlightenment. And then this, what's called parinamana, this transference or this dedication of merit. So here's the thing about upaya. So upaya is a paramita, a paramita. What, what's a paramita? You know what a paramita is, right? It's usually translated as perfection, but that's not actually what the word paramita means. Paramita literally means the other shore. So when we talk about like the paramita of giving, the dana paramita, it is the giving other shore. What does that mean? Well, I'm sure you're aware that there's this kind of metaphor within the world of Buddhism that talks about the world in which we live, call it samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And what they talk about is there's this river or a stream, and it's a, a river or a stream of psychic energy. I don't even know. I don't even know. But the idea, the metaphor, is that when sentient beings pass away, they enter this stream of transmigration. And it carries them, whoop, right back into samsara. <laughs> and then you pass away and enter the stream of transmigration and whoop, you wind up right back in samsara. And what you are doing is you are staying on this shore. But what the Buddhists talk about metaphorically is that across the stream of transmigration is the other shore, which is nirvana, liberation or escape from samsara. So it's about samsara and nirvana divided by this stream of transmigration that keeps plopping you back into samsara. But the Buddhists and many people, not just the Buddhists, but what Buddhism is about is in a way transcending that samsaric existence and making it to the other shore and within the world of mahayana buddhism there are six 
paramitas. There are six things, six practices that get you to the other shore. But there's actually 10 paramitas, at least officially, like within the world of Mahayana Buddhism, there's 10 practices or aspects of the path that paramita, that bring you to the other shore. So we are used to hearing about the six paramitas, giving, moral discipline, patience, drive or determination, meditation and wisdom. The sixth of those being pranya, pranya paramita, right? Transcendent wisdom or getting to the other shore by wisdom. But then added to that list of six, in the Mahayana tradition, they talk about a seventh paramita, upaya. And that's what this sutra is. In fact, this sutra is even kind of called the, um, at least in the Chinese, it's called the, the, para, the upaya paramita sutra in that way. So now upaya is another way to get to the other shore. But what exactly is upaya? They, like, what is it that would get me to the other shore? And that's where we return to the little section of the sutra that I just read. So the main idea of upaya, or one of the main ideas about upaya, is it's very much and only a practice that is involved or engaged with the other. Yes, giving is it in being engaged with the other, usually, of course, except the old school, original, kind of the Hinayana understanding of the paramita of giving the old school version for like a monastic, the practice of giving was giving away all of your worldly belongings because you were making the great renunciation. And so the practice of giving everything away in the Hinayana, it was still a practice that was kind of focused on self-improvement, if you will, self-liberation or self-enlightenment in that way. So even though giving sort of implies a, a receiver of those gifts, in the original formulation, the six paramitas were all sort of very focused on the self. Upaya is the bodhisattva's practice of, you could call it altruism, but it's the practice of this sort of a, a deep, genuine concern for the welfare of others. And not just the welfare of others, specifically the enlightenment of others. Because the greatest, for, at least for Buddhism, the greatest thing you know, that you could give someone is liberation from their suffering. Nothing really could be greater than that. And so that's sort of what, when they mention this idea of the, the skillful vow, the skillful vow of the bodhisattva, that skillful vow is this, well, it's, it's this inclusion, if you will, of all sentient beings into one's arena of practice, if you will. And again, the idea is, is that the bodhisattva is very, very interested in working for the liberation or awakening or enlightenment of all sentient beings. And that, that intention is just as important if not more important, than the bodhisattva's own cultivation of their own state of enlightenment. 
And in fact, what the Bodhisattva realizes is that the skillful vow of working for the awakening of all sentient beings is working on their own enlightenment. It, 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 that is doing it. In fact, it is doing it, meaning it is working on one's own liberation even more skillfully, more expediently. So what is upaya? Well, what we learned, and I'm actually kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but it seems appropriate to mention this. At the end of this section, this opening section where the Buddha talks to Nyanotara about how to practice upaya, at the very end of this section, the Buddha describes fulfilling all six paramitas by the first paramita. So this kind of interesting thing of fulfilling all the paramitas just through giving, <laughs> that you cultivate wisdom through giving, you cultivate meditative states of mind through giving, you practice patience through giving all six of the paramitas. And now the way that that kind of works for the bodhisattva is that it is not giving everything away for my benefit, meaning my awakening or my enlightenment. No, now because a bodhisattva practices upaya, they're going to be doing everything, whether it's giving, whether it's their own moral discipline, whether it's their own patience, but they're going to be doing everything with this skillful vow in mind. So again, the idea here is, is that the giving in the, in, the, in the act of, say, giving a gift, it is very much focused on the awakening of all sentient beings. And I want to emphasize something very kind of important. I keep mentioning this kind of key phrase, all sentient beings. And I want us to be really aware that within the world of Buddhism, they are very, very serious about all sentient beings. And what I mean by that is twofold. One is that it doesn't matter what kind of sentient being meaning it doesn't matter how big, how small, anything like that. So if it has sen if it has sensory organs <laughs> at all, it's considered a sentient being and therefore it was it is part of the bodhisattva's concern if you will. But then I also want to emphasize that they're talking about all sentient beings. Every single last one of them. And this is where I kind of often, you know, I, I often remind people when it comes to the cultivation of things like generosity and kindness and, and you know, all of these things, it's very easy to be kind and compassionate towards people you already like and already love and are already caring for. <laughs> The real practice is about bringing into that loving kindness all the sentient beings, even the ones you might not want to include. Those are the exact ones then you should be most interested in bringing into the fold is the idea. So again, when they say all sentient beings, the emphasis is, in, is on all of them and, and all of them to the point where even, and this is a much more of a Mahayana Buddhist thing, by the way, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, they talk a lot about microorganisms, those which you can't even see that are, say, in your stomach, taking care of you. <laughs> and so there are bodhisattva vows, uh, or bodhisattva prayers, or bodhisattva vows, when taking food which is, may this food be a gift and an offering to those sentient beings down there in my stomach that are keeping me alive. 
So that's again, I, I kind of share that one with you to just point at the extent to which they are really talking about all sentient beings. So the Buddha kind of instructs Nyanotara on how to sort of do that in a way in terms of bringing all sentient beings into their, um, you know, their concern in that way. And then also in what I read, this, this opening one, there was the introduction of this key bodhisattva technology. I would call it a bodhisattva technology. And it is the transference of merit. It's what most of the time in a book like this, you will see as dedication, the dedication of merit. I'm very big on, you know, I really want everyone to, everybody to know that this word, hari nirmana, it's a very interesting Sanskrit word. And the root of it, the idea of it is that it is very, it's transformative. It's very much about this sort of um, transforming the merit, transmuting it in a way. So because there's like this, this language of trans, this, this sort of shifting nature of it, I think transfer is a better translation than dedicate. Even though the practice of parinirmana in the Buddhist world, it does kind of take on a sort of dedication. And what I mean by that is it will literally be like um, to so-and-so, <laughs> like, here's your merit. And I, I don't mean that like a, like a love letter, but I mean that the transference of merit, it does in some Buddhist traditions, it becomes very directed. It's specifically in East Asia, it becomes directed towards deceased relatives. So you can transfer merit to deceased relatives, but it's from me to you. And when the movement of, of merit is more, I'm transferring this merit to my deceased parents or what have you, that is a little more about dedicating. And, you know, I never like to, I really, really don't like to put any practices down or anything like that, but we do want to compare practices. We don't want to put one above the other, but I do want to make a difference between the practice of transferring merit to individuals, the practice of transferring merit to say deceased relatives, versus what seems to be the practice of parinamana in the sutras, which is that the practice is always about transferring it to all sentient beings. And there's a way in which the technology do, it doesn't seem like it would work if it wasn't to all sentient beings. And again, this is where I don't want to put down the more specific dedicated practice, but I'm just saying that the way that it is presented in the sutras is that, and I, I've mentioned this before, I don't want to go too deep in it, but it all has to do with a certain, um, well, I guess there's this famous book um, by, um, well, there's this famous book, Cutting, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by uh, Chongyam Chumpa Rinpoche, I think his name is, the guy that founded Shambhala. And it's a, it's a good book because, you know, it talks about this idea of spiritual materialism and the idea that you, you know, you could give away all of your, your stuff, but you could then start collecting like little spiritual merit badges in that way, right? And it's like, oh yeah, I studied with Lama so-and-so and then I went and I did my dark retreat in Tibet and I did this and I did this. And you can start wearing all of that, like these badges. And so all of this spirituality can start to become just as problematic as the stuff you were attached to before you went on your 
your retreat in that way. So Buddhism, thousands of years ago, at least 2,000 years ago, Buddhism recognized that even though you could give up your stuff, you could become attached to the merit. You could become attached to the, the accomplishments. They're, they're, uh, they're called samapati, right? These attainments. You could get attached to that stuff. And so as a further practice of a bodhisattva, after a meditation or after studying or after anything, Oh, and actually, it even talks about it in here. Even if we were to give a little tiny bit of food, even to an animal, we take the merit, any merit that would have been gained from, from this generous act, and then we take that, we bundle it up, and we transfer any merit to all sentient beings. And that is how... That is how a bodhisattva who practices upaya can use even a little handful of food as alms for all sentient beings. That's how you can do it. By even the smallest little thing that you do that is virtuous, you can kind of amplify that by transferring it to all sentient beings. And this is a further practice, again, for the bodhisattva, of really practicing non-attachment, like really practicing this kind of letting go in that way, or relinquishment in that way. So, all right, any questions about just that opening idea, but that's sort of the idea of upaya. Okay, so even me saying that <clears throat> raises a question in my head. So the idea is, is what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I want to get back around to is upaya as the seventh paramita. So if upaya can get us to the other shore, uh, well, again, what is upaya? Well, it seems to be part of it is about transferring merit to all sentient beings. But is that it? No, not quite. <laughs> because there's a way in which you do something and then transfer the merit to the awakening of all sentient beings. So what's upaya? What, what do I do? <laughs> and the idea is, is this. And this is sort of what I wanted to kind of eventually come to as like, it, this is one of the major underlying themes of this sutra. What is upaya? Well, it could be anything. That's the point. It could be anything. But what makes it upaya is that it is something that is done with the benefit of the other in mind. That's the idea, is that my intention, like my samkalpa, or my resolve, my wish, is this sort of, yes, awakening of all sentient beings. Ultimately, that's like the major goal to bring all sentient beings to a state of awakening, to a state of Buddhahood. But we could also, without getting too exalted in our goal of like trying to liberate all sentient beings, we could also think about this as benefiting, being of benefit to all sentient beings. That would be the Buddhist language. And so what I mean is, is this, and, and, and yeah, I want to kind of start getting into the, the deeper parts of this sutra. So what did, ah, this is so tricky, but 
What the basic idea here is that the sutra is talking about after introducing the basic theme, the, Buddha, the sutra is then going to kind of digress into all of these backstories, right? Past lives of the Buddha, backstories of these other bodhisattvas who seemingly broke some rules or who seemingly transgressed in some way. But then each one of the stories, it gets revealed that they weren't actually transgressing any rules because their intention was always for the benefit of the other. And so what I mean is, is this, I wanna give you a very simple example like so simple, so like just, but the idea is, is that, so you take a precept, you take a rule like false speech, all right? Lying. So from an, a Hinayana point of view, false speech is a non-starter. It's like, nope, <laughs> that any form of, False speech is bad, wrong, demerit, akushalya, unexpedient. So you just don't do it. But then over here, you've got the bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva is operating not from the place of their own karmic load, like either their own karmic problem or not, the Bodhisattva is really genuinely concerned about the other. And so it might be that there's a circumstance, and I'm not even going to try to invent a hypothetical circumstance here, but it might be that there's a circumstance in which being honest could be harmful. Whereas to tell a kind of little lie in that way, could be the kind and compassionate thing to do. For the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva is more concerned about kindness and compassion than they are about blindly adhering to rules for their own morality in that way. And what I really want to emphasize before we even start diving back into the sutra, I really want to emphasize that this, this aspect of upaya, it's why this sutra is actually really tricky, because this aspect of upaya, where it's kind of like, it's kind of opening a little, it's opening a little bit of room for lying, for, for, for these transgressions. And it's saying that if your moral imperative is kindness and compassion. Kindness and compassion. This sutra, this kind of upaya tradition is saying, if, if you're operating from kindness and compassion, then the transgressions of rules kind of take second place to that. And this gets very tricky, very risky, very dangerous in the sense that a lot of real transgressions can come about from this. And so upaya is a very tricky game in that way. And it's why it's kind of very hard. It's very hard to put your finger on upaya. And it's because that upaya is, as I've already been saying so far, upaya is so much about this deep-seated intention of welfare for all sentient beings. And this is, I guess, what I want to say in just very simply. If you think about it, like really, like logically, philosophically in that way, and you think about a mind that is 100% for the other, 100% compassionate, kind, deeply. What this sutra has basically been saying is that someone who's operating from that level of kindness and compassion can do no wrong. 
and and what I want to say is is that I believe that <laughs> like I'm I'm on board with that, but the bodhisattva has to be very clear <laughs> with themselves about are you operating from kindness and compassion or are you actually trying to avoid an uncomfortable situation that would make you uncomfortable and that's ultimately about you only the bodhisattva knows you know and it would be unwise and unskillful for anybody to point the finger at the bodhisattva in fact that's actually what one of the stories is about right is about ananda pointing the finger at a bodhisattva based upon what ananda just saw but Ananda didn't know the backstory about why the Bodhisattva was doing these things. So the sutra is kind of aware of the tricky ground it's treading on in that way. So, yeah, so I just want to say that about Upaya, that it's tricky. It is a paramita that will get you to the other shore. And the trick about that is, is that it's about this loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings transferring merit to their benefit and being really clear about that. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, Maria. Um, I just wanted to add that um... I feel like this is something like a really easy example that came to mind for me was it seems like every good loving parent has had to practice some form of upaya like this at some point with a child to protect them from some unnecessary emotional or physical harm. Absolutely. In fact, Maria, it is said that the Bodhisattva looks upon all sentient beings like a parent looks upon children, all of them, and it is exactly like you just described, that exact same idea, which is the, the Buddhists use that exact same analogy, which is that a parent has only the child's welfare in mind utterly loving, utterly kind, and they themselves might seem to lie to them or seem to discipline them in some way when really it was all kindness and compassion. So that is the metaphor. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So I also wanted to remind you of one other thing really quickly. So the opening of this sutra begins with these eight, nine, or ten examples. And, you know, it's things like even gathering flowers and making offerings to, to Buddhas or statues of Buddhas, and then transferring the merit that would be gained from making those offerings to the benefit of all sentient beings. Even if we see other people benefiting or other people joyful, we should be joyful for them and then transfer the merit of that joy to all sentient beings. So we get a list of all of these kind of ways in which a bodhisattva could practice upaya. And then we get the section I mentioned, which is this, the way in which you could practice all paramitas through the paramita of giving. And that again, is an interesting place where, like, what is upaya then? Well, it could be giving. It could be being patient. It could be this. It could be that. It's like you don't ever really know what the upaya will be in that way. And in fact, one way of being skillful is to cultivate all the paramitas through way of giving. But then I didn't want us to miss, or I really wanted us to, to note this part it's so important so i'm on page 430 now and this is right after he gives the various um uh, ways of practicing the various paramitas and then this line this is a very important aspect of the bodhisattva path and an aspect of upaya he says the buddha says 
after giving, the bodhisattva analyzes these matters, thinking, who is the giver? Who is the recipient? Who is the one who receives the karmic results? After contemplating these, the bodhisattva finds that there is no giver, no recipient, and no one who will receive karmic results. This is the paramita of wisdom, practiced as upaya through giving. So that little thing there about the bodhisattva reflects there is no gift, there is no giver, there is no recipient, no karmic results from all of that. That is another kind of very important aspect to upaya slash the bodhisattva path. And what I mean is, is that if we go back to the opening of the sutra, the Buddha details those two parts of this. We're really, really concerned about the welfare of all sentient beings, and we're going to transfer all the merit to the welfare of all sentient beings. And the Bodhisattva is, has a particular aspiration. All knowing wisdom. This is what is called sarvanyana, often just translated as omniscience. But what is omniscience? What is sarvanyana? What is all knowing wisdom? Well, it's the fully enlightened state of a Buddha. That's the idea of sarvanyana. So you could, whenever you hear the language of the bodhisattva uh, vowing to attain anuttara samyak sambodhi or vowing to attain sarvanyana, what they're talking about is the bodhisattva's aspiration to become a buddha, a fully awakened being. So the bodhisattva is now kind of operating in those two dimensions, working for the benefit of all sentient beings and transferring all merit on their behalf and going for Buddhahood. Now, of course, the Bodhisattva understands that they're going to get to Buddhahood by being concerned about the welfare of all sentient beings and transferring the merit to all their benefit. But there's another aspect of all-knowing wisdom, and it has to do with that part at the end there about no gift, no giver, no recipient. And this is a really important, tricky part of the Bodhisattva path. It has to do with this, you know, really fundamental teaching of emptiness that we talk a lot about it in Dharma doors. And that's what they're referring to, where the Bodhisattva understands that ultimately there is no giver, there is no recipient, and there's actually not even anything given. So that's the Bodhisattva's mentality about all of this. There is no gift, there is no giver, there is no recipient. But then why do they do it? And that is exactly where the Bodhisattva resides. Right in that spot between those two ideas. And what I mean is, is this. There is, you may have heard about it. There's a, it gets, to, it even comes up in our sutra a lot. It's what they call a pratekya Buddha, a solitary enlightened Buddha, or just a solitary Buddha. And these sutras, these Mahayana sutras, they are always warning the Bodhisattva to not follow the path of the pratekya Buddha. But what's a Pratekya Buddha, you may ask? Well, they're a Buddha. They're an awakened being, but they are a solitary awakened being. And that can be understood two different ways. Actually, it's, it could be understood in many ways. One understanding of a solitary Buddha is that they get awakened all by themselves. They don't 
need any dharma they don't need any buddhas they don't need any anything they just you know sitting on a rock one day and boop realize like they get it so that's one reason why they're sometimes called a solitary buddha more often though they're called a solitary buddha because they have no congregation they do not teach they are just awakened they are enlightened and I'll tell you a little bit more about the Pratekya Buddha. So what makes them a Buddha, an awakened being, is this complete understanding of dependent origination, which implies the emptiness of all phenomena. As I often like to say, the, the teaching of dependent origination is the teaching of emptiness. Like, because... The one implies the other in that way. So a Buddha is one who understands dependent origination and emptiness in that way. That is like really one of the defining characteristics of a Buddha. But what makes a Pratekya Buddha a Pratekya Buddha is that they sink into the understanding that there is no giver, there is no recipient, there is no gift. And so why bother with any of it? I will be over in my cave meditating. And that's why the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva stuff, they're like, don't, don't be a Pratekya Buddha. Because you will ultimately just be alone in a cave thinking you're enlightened. <laughs> is the idea. But my point is, is this. A Pratekya Buddha has that understanding of emptiness and then therefore, in a way, just checks out. Now, they're not suffering. They've achieved the goal. They're awakened. They're enlightened. So there's no, um, it's like, yeah, you know, good for them and honestly good for them. But the reason why these Mahayana Sutras don't want you to be a Pratekya Buddha is because and this is the language that they use, by the way. They say that in the world of the Pratekya Buddha, the lineage of the Buddhas is cut off. That basically whatever that person realized is going to fade away when they fade away. And so the Bodhisattva is a Buddha in the making. So they are going for Buddha knowledge. They are going for Buddha wisdom, which, as I just said, means understanding dependent origination and emptiness. And so from a wisdom point of view, the Bodhisattva is operating entirely from an understanding of dependent origination and emptiness. There is no gift. There is no giver. There is no recipient. But what makes them a Bodhisattva is they've made this great vow to liberate all sentient beings. And so that keeps the Bodhisattva dynamically active in the world, while over here they, they know there are no sentient beings. And at first, this seems like an utter paradox. The Bodhisattva vows to save all sentient beings, even though they know there's no such thing as a sentient being? Like, how does that add up? Well, originally, when I first started studying this, it seemed paradoxical. But after I studied more and particularly learned more about that Pratekya Buddha path, that's when I learned or figured out, oh, this Bodhisattva thing is really smart. <laughs> and it's really smart because there's a way in which this wisdom keeps us calm but this vow keeps us active. And those two actually start working together. And what I mean by that is the more the Bodhisattva practices this altruistic, uh, this altruistic disposition towards all sentient beings, they are increasing in their wisdom because and let me get to like the deeper psychology of all of this. The deeper psychology of all of this, as you know, has to do with 
the karma by just by which I just mean the activities that we do, the activities that construct a delusional sense of self. And the Bodhisattva understands that one of the things that constructs a delusional sense of self is a kind of stingy hoardingness, a kind of like, oh, I'm just going to keep this one for me. And I'm not going to tell anybody that I got this one because they'll want some of it. So I'm going to just be over here. The Bodhisattva sees that that hoarding kind of selfish mentality further constructs that delusional sense of self. In other words, there's a, a, a tendency of kind of closing in and becoming myopic in terms of the self, where we only are worried about ourself. And we might even develop the attitude, which I have heard people express, it's the attitude that everybody is just in this alone. So everybody should just look out for themselves in that way. And the Buddhists have recognized that that sort of turning inward and just being concerned about the self, whoo, once you start going down that road, oh my gosh, you can really start to then become obsessed and obsessive about that delusional sense of self. And then the anxiety and the stress and the dukkha can get really out of control when you are so turned inward and obsessing about a delusional sense of self. So something that can really help with that is an outward turning of the heart and practicing things like generosity, practicing things like loving kindness and compassion and these things. So the Bodhisattva understands that there's a, a deep thing going on here. And when you practice giving, you're undoing that. So that practice then allows for more wisdom. And then as I get wiser about things like dependent origination and emptiness, turning inward starts to seem crazy. And so my wisdom now is supporting my activity over here of being generous and being, I'm now even more generous and kind. And so now you get this real nice back and forth thing going where the wisdom is being supported by the action, but the action is being supported by the wisdom. And it's that kind of activity that makes Buddhas in that sense. So. Yes, no. Uh, yes. I just heard this the other day. I wanted to share. A Buddha always says hello. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was great. And this is exactly what we're what's being spoken to. You know, why, why, hello. I yep. think this is so uh, upayak. <laughs> Excellent, Noe. Yeah, it's that real, that real difference of having our head down as we walk down the street, not making eye contact, you're in your world, I'm in my world. And you can notice how if you're obsessing or worried about something, then looking at your feet as you walk down the street and worrying about what you're worrying about, like it can, it, it compounds itself. Whereas as Noe just suggested, sort of more having the eyes meeting people is a great way to start not obsessively focusing on that delusional sense of self. So excellent, Noe. Okay, so then let's just kind of go through the major bullet points or the major movements, I'd say, of the sutra. So I have, I have this sutra broken into seven, like, I wouldn't call them chapters exactly, but like seven divisions. The first division is the opening in which Nyanotara asks the question and the Buddha gives all of these eight or nine to 10 answers for how to practice Upaya. Then the sutra, oh, I forgot to mention, 
Then after that, Nyanotara asks one more question. And the question is at the bottom of page 430. And it's basically a question as world honored one. When does a bodhisattva commit transgressions? Which is a reasonable question to ask, given the conversation that we've just had about Upaya, where the, the bodhisattva's main concern is loving kindness and compassion towards all sentient beings. And that might like that might require transgressing a rule in that way. So the bodhisattva asks, okay, fine, I get that. So when does a bodhisattva transgress a rule? And basically we are told that if a bodhisattva loses their kindness and compassion for all sentient beings, that's transgressing for a bodhisattva. That's what it means to transgress. So that sort of is the conclusion, I would say, of that first section. And Nyanotada, or superior wisdom bodhisattva, their question about heavy transgressions is the question that is now answered through to the end of the sutra. And there's a way in which I even forgot because of uh, you know, we've been going through the sutra for so long. There's a way in which I forgot that that was Nyanotara's question. And I wish I kind of would have been better about remembering that because all of the rest of the sutra are dealing with things like murder, <laughs> um, sex, which for at least a monastic is a major transgression. And so this question about major transgressions and then like, when does a bodhisattva break a rule? That's what leads to these remaining sections. So part one, I say, I would say is the opener. And then part two is the section about bodhisattva king honored by all. And this is the bodhisattva who was sitting on a couch with a woman. <gasps> and Ananda saw the bodhisattva sitting on a couch with a woman and freaked because he's Ananda, the, the monk. And for someone like Ananda, you definitely are not supposed to be sitting on the same couch as a woman. You are not even really supposed to be anywhere near a woman for a monastic in the original form of Buddhism. So Ananda tells on the Bodhisattva, but then we hear this long backstory about how actually the Bodhisattva and this woman had basically been married in a previous life. So they had this kind of karmic bond and the Bodhisattva was actually reciting an enlightenment poem to this woman and then causing her to become enlightened. So the Buddha says, so there's no transgression. In fact, Ananda, you have transgressed by basically being a tattletale and not minding your own business in that way. He, basically, the Buddha says that to call out a bodhisattva and slander them unfounded, that's a transgression. So, um, and by the way, there is this, uh, this, this is a theme um, that you find in many sutras, and it's the theme of either uh, a bodhisattva or somebody maybe going into a brothel, but they only go into the brothel to recite sutras for everybody. Um, there's a few different sutras where this is a thing that happens. And I just want to make it clear, or I want to emphasize, in the Hinayana, in the early form of Buddhism, just going near a brothel would have been a transgression of the precepts. It would have been considered uh, defiling, making the monks impure, or the nuns, but it would be making the monastic unpure to even go near these places. 
so this is a very different type of Buddhism then. If these places are not considered defiling or impure in that way. So this is sort of, you know, I've, I've said it before in many Dharma, Dharma doors past, the early form of Buddhism, the monastic Hinayana, it can get very puritanical. It can suffer from a lot of that uh, Catholic guilt type stuff around things, even around the body, guilt around the body, stuff like that starts to happen in the that type of Buddhism, which is again why I prefer the more Mahayana form, which is this bodhisattva practice. All right. Um, after king honored by all, after we get that, we then transition into the backstory of the Buddha. So we start to get introduced to these past lives of the Buddha. And the first one that we hear about is when the Buddha was a brahmacharin named Jyotis, a constellation. And the important thing to know about a brahmacharin, a brahmacharin, that word brahmacharya is the practice, one who practices brahmacharya is a brahmacharin. And what that word implies is celibacy. It implies austerities of certain sense, but the primary austerity is about celibacy. So the Buddha in a previous life was a brahmacharin, a celibate practitioner named Constellation. But there was a circumstance with a woman in which he decided out of compassion to actually give up his life as a brahmacharin, and he got married to this woman. <laughs> and they stayed married for 12 years or whatever it was. And the Buddha says, and that's why in this life, before I became awakened, when I still lived at the palace of my father, I got married to Yashodra, which this sutra calls, uh, they call her Gopa, I think. But her name is usually Yashodra. So the idea again is, is that these two people had karmic affinities from the past that were still kind of present in the present life. And so that's why the Buddha or Siddhartha got married to this person. Now, one of the things, this is another thing that we kind of gets missed if you don't study the whole sutra in one shot. This uh, Brahmacharin constellation, this previous life of the Buddha, this actually becomes the like, I would call it like the through line or like the thread that runs through all the rest of the sutra. So this is the, the introduction of the Brahmacharan constellation, but this backstory of the Buddha keeps popping up again and again and again. But in between that, in between the popping up, we get the story of the monk Vimala, who in a previous, like in a previous life situation, this monk was sleeping in a cave and then there was this woman who got stuck in a rainstorm. So she uh, went into the cave to seek shelter. And then the next day, a group of meditators saw this woman come out of Vimala's cave, uh, out of the monk Vimala's cave. And so they blamed Vimala. They blamed this monk for basically sleeping with this woman. But again, they didn't know the whole story. They didn't know the whole deal. So there's another one of those, like a story about falsely accusing bodhisattvas. Then we get this, that, the story of bodhisattva loving deed. And this is yet just another kind of story. This is a story about, again, sexuality. The idea here is, is that 
Bodhisattva loving deed was this like handsome Bodhisattva that went to the house of some elder one day to beg for food. And the elder's daughter, increasing virtue, saw the Bodhisattva, basically became you know, enraptured by him, kind of desirous of him. And because of her desire for the Bodhisattva, she burned up. <laughs> so she burned up in her desire, but she was reborn as a god. Normally, if you burned up with desire, you would be reborn in a lower realm. But what we learn is that because of the virtue of this bodhisattva, loving deed, that even if somebody looks at the bodhisattva with desire, it's beneficial for that person ultimately. And they go and get reborn as a god. And this is where I want to pause just for a minute, because I want to remind you of something that I said the night that we kind of studied this uh, section. So it's very important, I think, to keep in mind that, especially with a sutra like this, that's about upaya, these stories are so layered and so much metaphor is going on that they're like kind of tricky to read. But one of the things that I detected that's going on with this story of loving, of the increasing virtue woman burning up upon seeing the bodhisattva, they seem to be introducing basically what would become known as Vajrayana or the a, a Vajrayana practice. Because one of the aspects of Vajrayana, if the kind of what the so-called third turning of the Dharma wheel, one aspect of Vajrayana is about actually harnessing things like desire. Not exactly um, suppressing them like in the early form of Buddhism and not exactly sort of just mindfully observing them like you would in the Mahayana, but in the Vajrayana, you, you can actually be encouraged to go into the desire only to go through it. You know, the goal is still the same, which is kind of to transcend these things. But my point is, is that because the Vajrayana talks about desire as a kind of a good thing, or at least potentially having goodness, and then you couple that with the fact that it's in the Vajrayana that you get what is called deity yoga, where you actually gaze upon images of bodhisattvas, even with a sort of a desire in a way. And then it is that sort of adoration, that kind of loving, that kind of desire for the bodhisattva that becomes a practice in Vajrayana Buddhism. And it seems to me that that kind of practice is being um, narrativized in this section here. So again, very, you could read these sutras in many different levels in that way. So, all right, any questions about any of that so far? Cool, so that would have been for by my division of the text, Bodhisattva loving deed, that whole section would have been section five. Yeah, the, the monk in the cave with the woman is section four. And then the backstory of the Buddha as the Brahmacharya and constellation is section three. Then really only two more sections by my division of the text. Section six, I would call, I did call actually, because I did the Dharma talk on it, the wasteland. This is the part where all of a sudden, Kashyapya, 
Kashyapa steps up. And Kashyapa, one of the early disciples of the Buddha, he proceeds to give a, an analogy. And what it is, is that he gives this story about this wasteland, this that's just like it's just famine and strife. And there's all these people living in this wasteland. And there's only one way out of the wasteland. And it's this very, very narrow bridge that will fall off on either direction. And so you can't look left. You can't look right. You just got to keep moving forward. And Kashapya gives this kind of story of the wasteland and this narrow bridge to get out of it. But then he interprets his own story. And he says, yeah, the wasteland, that's samsara. Oh yeah, the narrow way out, that's the dharma, that's the practice. All of these things he describes. So this is sort of just like a little mini section all by itself. And my only kind of comment about this section, and it's about this section, and it's kind of about the whole sutra. So I've also mentioned at some point during this series that this sutra has a lot of overlap with the Lotus Sutra. So the Lotus Sutra here, the Lotus Sutra. So the Lotus Sutra, as you may know, is a very famous Buddhist sutra. In, in some Buddhist circles, this is the only sutra. <laughs> like it's that important in a lot of forms of Japanese Buddhism. This is the only sutra there is. Everything else was just getting ready for this. The thing about this sutra is that this is the sutra for Upaya. Like that's what the theme of this sutra is. So again, there's a lot of overlap. And I would even say, like me personally, as like a um, as like a sutra head, somebody that really, really likes sutras, if you asked me, this Upaya Sutra that we've been reading is like the not so good, not so polished version of the Lotus Sutra. <laughs> There's a way in which this one is a little rough. It's a little uh, piecemeal. Like it feels a little cobbled together. And I don't know, there's just, it, it's cool. But if you were at all interested in this type of sutra, this is the Upaya Sutra in that way. And Kashyapa's story about the wasteland has a lot of parallels in the Lotus Sutra. But it's also, it's also about this thing of, telling a story and then dissecting the story and saying, and this is what that represented. And this is what that represents. And that's what that represents. That is something that happens a lot in the Lotus Sutra, where you get a story and then you get its own like dissecting. And what I want you to know is that that type of uh that type of storytelling, the type of analogies and similes, those are considered upaya. Like, meaning a story or a simile or an analogy is considered a skillful means. It's considered a very skillful way of delivering the Dharma in that sense. So... All right. And then the last section of the sutra by my divisions, section seven, and this is where it actually gets very interesting. So I would put this, let's see, where'd you go? So if you have the book and you want to look, I'm jumping over to page 442. 
And this is where, um, actually, this is where, depending on which version of the sutra you read, the Buddha's talking to somebody different. It doesn't really make a big difference um, which bodhisattva the Buddha's talking to. But again, it's different in the in the different versions that we have. But the Buddha says to the bodhisattva, whoever the bodhisattva might be, uh, that you shouldn't have any doubt about the Buddhas or the bodhisattvas. And why? Because Buddhas and bodhisattvas have achieved inconceivable upaya, and they abide in all kinds of upaya to teach and convert sentient beings. And then he says, there's a sutra named the Upaya Paramita Sutra, which I shall explain to you. And that's where we should say, wait, are, haven't we been reading the Upaya Pranya Paramita Sutra? The Lotus Sutra does the same kind of thing where you're reading the Lotus Sutra, but then it talks about the Lotus Sutra. And you're like, but wait, I thought I was reading the Lotus Sutra. What's all this about? So again, an interesting parallel with the Lotus Sutra. So we are now, you know, what, 10, like 10 pages into the Sutra. And the Buddha says, now I'm going to tell you a Sutra, the Upaya Sutra. And the entire rest of the sutra, which I guess is the Upaya Sutra, is the life story of the Buddha retold point by point, and it retells the entire story of the Buddha where everything was in Upaya. And so that is sort of the conclusion of the sutra. But one thing that I want to say, just to make this a, a, a complete kind of summary of this, in this Upaya Sutra at the end, it all kind of centers around one question, and it's that there was a previous life of the Buddha when the Buddha was constellation, the Brahmacharan. And he seemed to slander and say bad things about the Buddha that was alive at that time, who was a Buddha named Kashyapa. The Buddha seemed to say negative things about that bald head, like something to the effect that, you know, how could a bald head ever get enlightened? And it sounded derogatory or slanderous. So I just want you to note that that's the return of the backstory about constellation. So that's kind of woven throughout this whole sutra. And then again, we get all of these, you know, even from when before the Buddha was born and he was in the Tushita heaven and then descending into his mother's womb and then jumping out of her right-hand side, taking seven steps, living in a palace, getting married, renouncing. All of these events of the life of the Buddha are retold. And they're retold in, and I, I want to I wanna share with you a, a, a word. It's a, it's a technical term, not a Buddhist term. It's like a study of religion term. So the study of religion term that I would like you to know, it's like the, bo the bonus tonight. So there's a word that's called uh, doceticism. Uh, or, and it's just called, uh, so I guess it would be D-O-C-E-T-I-C, -E docetic, I believe is the word, and doceticism. It, again, this is like study of religion stuff. Like it's, it's weird words that we make up to describe activity in that way. But what it is, is it's a, it's a phenomena and doceticism is usually associated with Christianity. And what that is, is that 
in the early days of Christianity, there were different sects, different groups of Christians that broke off because they didn't think that Jesus was human. Mainstream Catholicism, like the mainstream church, is founded on the idea that Jesus was a, a human. Yeah, it gets complicated in terms of like son of God, homo osea, of the same nature as God and all of that. But in the normal, regular Christianity, Jesus was like a human born in that way. But some groups of Christians split off and they say, nah, he didn't actually die. It was all a performance. It was all a show for humanity's sake. But Jesus was never human, didn't die, none of that. And what they call that is doceticism. When you, it's this idea that the person that we thought was human really wasn't from earth or really wasn't from around here. So it was, it was all just sort of a performance for humanity's sake. Well, that's kind of what's going on in this sutra as well where all of these the significant moments in the life of the Buddha are retold from the point of view that they were just performances in that way. And the only thing that I want to say about that without confusing you at all, I, you know, I want to try to summarize this, but one of the things that you should keep in mind, Buddhism is very very aware of like Buddhism is very or at least these Mahayana sutras are very aware of language and literature and what I'm what I mean is and I say this often in Dharma doors but this sutra this text it knows that this is not a historical event. It knows the Buddha didn't say these things. It knows it's a story. And so there's a way in which it is referring to itself. And so when I or anybody tells you these stories, it is a performance. It is a show in that way. And so there's a way in which this Upaya Sutra is, in a way, even aware of this, like what's going on here in that way. In fact, it, it, what I think it is hoping is that someday somebody will pick this up and teach it in that way and, and keep the lineage of the Buddhas going in that sense. So, all right. So on that note, that will conclude the Upaya Kashalya Sutra. <laughs> Yay. And of course, may the merit of this sutra recitation go to the liberation of all sentient beings. All right. That's it. <laughs>